Hello and welcome to another edition of the Middle East Report. In this edition of the Middle East Report, we'll be looking at the battle for Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem so significant, not only to the Jewish people, but why the uh, Muslims particularly want a battle over Jerusalem. We'll also be discussing the threat posed by um, Hezbollah to Israel and uh, what do they really believe, what are their true intentions, and also be looking at the rise of Iran in the Middle East. And finally, the issue we'll be discussing is the Arab Spring. Will the Arab Spring mean that the Middle East will have an opportunity for, for democracy and freedom, or will it turn into a, a dark winter with the rise of Islamic extremism across the Arab world? And to discuss these vital and important issues affecting the Middle East, I'm, I'm honoured today, and it's such a privilege to be joined by Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Mordecai Kedder from the Begin and Sadat Centre. Um, hello, Mordecai, and uh, welcome yes, to the Middle East Report. It's, it's a real privilege and honour to have someone of such uh, prestige joining us today. Um, can you firstly describe, you, in your uh, biography, it talks about how you served 25 years in military Israeli intelligence. Uh, can you tell, tell our viewers something about uh, your experiences within this role within the Is Israeli Defense Force? Well, already in high school, I studied Arabic, and Arabic is not my mother tongue. Uh, my parents came from Poland uh, before the Second World War, but uh, I had a very, very good teacher for Arabic in the high school, at the late Dov Iron, and uh, he got us to love the language, but not only language, also as a tool to look at the whole world the Arab world, which is a totally different from Western societies which we live in in Israel. Mm. And uh, this, the, the language actually became a key to open this wide door to see different literature, different poetry, different religion, different history, different societies in the Arab world. And this was actually the introductory to the army. The army uh, uh, of course, uh, recruited those who finished Arabic major uh, to the intelligence because we had the language. And uh, I served uh, 25 years in, in the army in, in, a unit, in a unit which uses Arabic primarily in order to understand what goes on in the Arab uh, world. Uh, after 25 years of service, uh, I got released and I went to the academia. And now I am a lecturer in Bar Ilan University and also a member in Begin Sadat Center inside this uh, university. This center uh, belongs to the Department of uh, uh, Political Science, and uh, it looks at the Middle East from st strategic point of view, armies, balance of power, mm. and all these things which enable people to understand what happened in the Middle East on the strategic uh, uh, arena. However, uh, some professors in Bar Ilan uh, are willing, and I, I am one of them, are willing to establish a new center parallel to Begin Sadat Center, which will deal more with Islam as a religion, with Arab societies, with Arab youth, mm -hmm. which Besser Center usually doesn't deal with, with issues, with societies and trends in societies and changes in societies, because uh, beneath the politics, there is sociology. And today, especially, we see how sociology becomes much more important than politics, actually influences politics to a large extent. So this is why we want today to establish this center, and we are still waiting for somebody who would like to support us with this. Uh, and another reason is <clears throat> because many research centers today in the world, also here in Britain, but in other places in the world, are bought by Gulf money, by oil money. And everything which is, or most of the things which are published in conferences and scholarships, everything is di directed according to the, uh, to the dictates which come from the Gulf on these research centers. And we saw only recently something in Yale University which happened because of this. We in Bailan will never be bought by Gulf money. We will say the truth about the Middle East, about development of the Middle East, mm. and we'll set a, a new discourse about the Middle East 
which will be much more realistic and not influenced by Gulf money. And this is, I think, urgent for the world to see the reality of the Middle East. I mean, you, you talked about earlier there serving 25 years in Israeli military intelligence. Um, what changes have you seen the Arab world go through over the last 25 years, 35 years? Well, it's not only 25 years. Mm. Uh, all the Arab states were created, or the borders, their borders were marked by the colonialism, either the British or the French or the Italian. This is why the frameworks of those states are in most cases illegitimate because the people who live there do not view the state as something which belongs to them, as something which the Brits or the French or the others marked. Another thing is that since every one of these states is a conglomerate mm. of tribes, of ethnic groups like Arabs and Kurds in Iraq, of religions and sects, uh, which historically they tend to quarrel with each other and not to live with peace with each other. This is why internally these states are shaky and needed dictators in order to impose law and order on these places. This is why you saw those dictators, Saddam Hussein and Assad and, and then the kingdoms and, and Gaddafi and all those, only because if they didn't maintain law and order with an iron fist, the whole system would, would be blown up. So uh, this is why the regime also is illegitimate. The state is illegitimate, and the regime is illegitimate because it, on, it represents only one small sect or, or tribe or ethnic group. Today what happens is that those people are challenging the borders. Why? Already in Iraq, we have an independent state named Kurdistan, Although it, did, it didn't uh, declare independence, but they have their own army, their own, their own government, parliament, mass media, economy, and uh, their army, the Peshmerga, is much more powerful than the Iraqi army. So they are independent, factually, today. Um, Libya might be divided to two states, the coalition of Gaddafi and the coalition of those who don't want him, because if they will be merged again, they will slaughter each other. Uh, Sudan, these days, mm. is going to be divided to two states, uh, Islamic Arabic uh, uh, state in the north and Christian and animist state in the south. Again, according to religious lines, a state is uh, going to be depar uh, 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 departed to parts. And this is actually the trend. Syria, when the Syrian regime will collapse, not if, when it collapses, the state might be fragmented to five or six states, the Alawi state in the west, the Kurdish state in the north, just like the brothers in Iraq, a Druze state in the south, they will resume the independence which they had until 1925, the Bedouins in the east, and Aleppo will have the, uh, the opportunity to get rid of the Damascene uh, uh, elite. So, actually, they will resume the picture of how Syria was under the Ottoman Empire, fragmented to homogeneous groups. And this is actually the natural situation in the Middle East, not the conglomerates. How do we know this? The Gulf. The Gulf is very calm, very stable, not because of the oil. Dubai has no oil, and uh, Iraq has also oil, and Iraq is not a stable state. The Gulf is stable only because Every state, like Kuwait, Qatar, and the seven Emirates, is one tribe. Interesting. Very when interesting. one tribe controls itself, mm. and the leadership of the tribe, the traditional leadership, becomes the modern leadership of the state, of the tribe state, this is a legitimate state mm. and a, legitim a legitimate regime. This is why you don't hear about demonstrations in Qatar or in uh, uh, Dubai or in, in Abu Dhabi, on Sharqa, on Majman, all these. You do here in, in, in Bahrain, because in Bahrain, it's a majority of Shiites. Part of them speak um, Persian, while majority, a minority of, of, uh, Muslim, of Sunni Muslims who were brought by the British are controlling the state. So this actually is like the conglomerates, which the illeg illegitimate uh, state and the illeg illegitimate uh, regime. So what happens 
doing uh, the last six months is actually the people challenge the illegitimacy of the regime. And they want to have their own regime. Whether democratic or not, I, I, I won't get into this because democracy is a very complicated cake with ingredients like human rights, political freedoms, uh, uh, women's rights, mm -hmm. minority rights, and many of those freedoms and rights are not accepted in Islamic societies, especially Christian rights. And as you know, uh, the situation of Christians in the Middle East today is very bad. Look what happened in the, with the Copts in Egypt, what happened in the Maronites in Lebanon, what happens to the Christians in Iraq, in the Palestinian Authority, they have to run away. So all these places where Islamism takes over, Christians uh, uh, feel very bad and they immigrate in large numbers. So a, a, a minority rights in Islamic society is something uh, very weird and not, not so, so uh, willingly uh, accepted. So when you're talking about democracy in the Western style, this is very far from uh, what might happen even in the uh, Arab Spring. They, they might have some freedoms like in the Gulf, but democracy, as in Britain or in the United States of America, I, it, it has to take time. Okay, which, which also leads us on to there is a big battle for um, Jerusalem. As we know, yeah. Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Um, and it's in scriptures, in, in, in the Holy Bible, both in the Torah, the Tanah, and also in Christian scribes' New Testament as well, pays homage to the fact of Jewish ownership of that city. But what is, the, uh, what is the Muslim viewpoint, and why is Jerusalem all of a sudden so significant to the, to the Muslims, and particularly to the Palestinian authorities, to, declared that East Jerusalem will be part of uh, a potential uh, Palestinian state? Well, for this, you, are, you have to understand uh, the nature of how Islam views Judaism and Christianity. Uh, in its own view, Islam came to the world not to live side by side with Judaism and Christianity. It rather came to the world to replace both Judaism and Christianity. And this is why Islam actually took to itself or Islamized the persons who are in the Bible. Abraham was the first Muslim, and Isaac and Jacob were Muslims. Even Jesus and, and, and Johannes are Muslims. And Sol King Solomon built a mosque in Jerusalem. How, 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 how did it happen? Since Islam nullified Judaism and Christianity, everyone who ever believed in one single God evidently was a Muslim, what else could it be? Could it be? This is why retroactively they Islamize everything which was before Islam came to the world in the seventh century. So actually Jews and Christians, who Jews, as you know, according to the first chapter of the Islam, are those upon whom the wrath of Allah rests, and Christians are those who went astray. Okay? Uh, Jews are Al Mardub Alayhim in Arabic, and, and, uh, and the Christians are Ad Dalun, well, those who went astray. So they have no right to claim anything in this world because they lost everything since Allah took from both religions the gospel and the significance. So this is why uh, 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 Muslims had no problem turning uh, um, churches into mosques. It happened on the Temple Mount, mm. in the center, where the uh, Dome of the Rock. There was a church until the 7th century. They did it in Ramla, in, in, in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel. They did it in Damascus. They did it in Istanbul. They did it in many places in Spain. Because anyway, Christianity lost its value. Why do Christians need uh, 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 churches? So they did to, to, to synagogues. Now, what happened is something uh, uh, tremendous. Jews are coming back to the land. In 1948, they already established their state. 1967, they took Jerusalem. What will be the, the next step? God for Allah forbid, they will build the third temple. And this, in this way, Judaism will come back to life, will resurrect from the exile. So what will be with Islam? 
Because if Islam came to the world to replace Judaism, they cannot fathom the fact that Ju Judaism comes back to life by regaining the rule over, uh, over the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and of course, the temple place. Uh, this is why the, the, the temple, or Jerusalem, is, I think, the first bastion of the fight of Islam against Judaism and against Christianity. After all, where did the, uh, Jesus Christ uh, preach, if not that uh, particular place? And in their, in their view, in their discourse, this, this is a war between Din al-Haq, means the religion of, uh, of truth, which is Islam, and Din al-Batil, the religion which is void, religions, which is uh, uh, Judaism and Christianity. So this is why the Battle of Jerusalem, the, it's not about territory. It's about theology before territory. Mm. The territory is only the manifestation or the territorial manifestation of a theologic struggle between Islam, which views itself as the only religion in, in the world, as it's stated in the Quran, inna dina inda al-Islam, means the religion at Allah's is Islam, not Judaism and not uh, uh, Christianity. And so this is why the fact that Jews, with the support, of course, of the Christians, of Europeans, who implanted the Jews since 1917, the Balfour Declaration, in, in the land of Israel. This is a, a scheme of Jews and Christians to regain Jerusalem in, in order to challenge the, the validity of Islam. So this is actually the struggle in their view. This is why they keep claiming that there was never a temple in this place. Maybe it was in Shechem, in, in Nablus, maybe it was in Sinai. And uh, this is today is the discourse after they see what happens in the land of Israel. However, I must mention, before they saw this danger of the Zionists to come back to their land, in the 20s and the 30s, they had absolutely no problem publishing a booklet by the Supreme Muslim Council. Uh, and, and this is an original, a brief guide to al haram sharif Jerusalem, published by the Supreme Muslim Council. This cost 200 mils. And in um, and, and the Supreme uh, Muslim Council of those days, was, uh, the head of this was the Haj Amir al-Husseini, who was a very, very anti-Zionist man. He took part in the extermination of the Jews of Hungary in 1944. He recruited Muslims from Bosnia to guard the bridges of the trains which took the Jews from Hungary to be exterminated in Auschwitz in order to make sure that nobody blows those bridges up. Okay? This is how small Zionist he was. Now, in the 30s, when it, even, even in the 20s, it has some more uh, versions. He has no problem saying in this booklet about the Al Haram Sharif, about the Temple Mount, and I quote, um, its identity with the site of Solomon's Temple is beyond dispute. Oh, yeah. This is what he writes in mm -hmm. 1930, since he didn't see then the Zionist problem uh, to, to that extent. This too is the spot, according to the universal belief, universal belief, mm. on which, and now he quotes a verse from the uh, second book of Shmuel, David built an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, published by the Supreme Muslim Council of Jerusalem, 1930. Today, the discourse is totally different. There was no, no temple and Jews have no connection to Jerusalem. All the excavations and all the archaeology are, is a falsification uh, of Jews and Christians. And uh, the whole claim of Jews to Jerusalem uh, has no basis whatsoever. So this is how politics change the discourse. But the basis of their fear from Jewish control over Jerusalem is that Judaism will come back to life. And this will pose a question about the validity of Islam which in its own view came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity. Mm. Uh, I mean, talking about within 
Islam, I mean the two holy sites, uh, Mecca and Medina, and historically we know that the uh, Temple Mount has never really played a significant part in Islamic history or even identification. So why is there, uh, also we have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Yusuf al Qadari, the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, declare that he wants to see Jerusalem as the center for Islam. Um, why is there such a, a, a control of wanting to control Jerusalem? In, in a sense, will control of Jerusalem mean that they will have control over Israel and then control over the West? They think that if they get control over Jerusalem, this will be the first victory on Judaism and Christianity mm. and everything else will fall like domino effect. Jerusalem is the first and when this falls into their hands forever, everything else will fall under the, the hoofs of the horses as it did in the, in the 7th century. However, I must mention here another thing. Jerusalem is viewed as the third place in holiness only in the Sunni Islam. Shiite Islam traditionally views Najaf in Iraq as the third place in holiness because Ali, the founder of the Shia, is buried there. They know that those who sanctified Jerusalem 50 years after Muhammad uh, passed away, they did it only because they wanted to find an alternative place for pilgrimage because of a rebellion which uh, took place in Mecca in 682 50 years after Muhammad passed away, and they couldn't go to pilgrimage in Mecca, so they took Jerusalem for like eight or nine years as an alternative place for pilgrimage, and this because of the political problems inside uh, Islam. They sanctified Jerusalem uh, to challenge the hegemo hegemony of Mecca because the Umayyads who uh, 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 controlled the, the, the Islamic empire from Damascus wanted the sanctuary to be closer to him to them and not the people will go down to Mecca to hear the propaganda of the Shiites against the Sunni regime in, uh, in uh, Damascus. And this again, how politics uh, divert the religious issues in Islam. Mm. And uh, as uh, too many know, politics and religion in Islam is two, side, two sides of the same coin. And, and, and really, one other issue that Israel is really facing um, is a threat from Hezbollah in, in southern Lebanon. And um, recent, there was a recent statement by the U.S. Secretary of Defense um, that said that Hezbollah is now in possession of chemical and biological weapons, has more than 50,000 rockets and missiles um, targeted Israel. Do you believe that, uh, is, that uh, Hezbollah is preparing for another war? Uh, against Israel, as you saw in 2006. Uh, and what is the motivation behind um, Hezbollah's actions? Well, assuming that they are not uh, willing to have those missiles in order to scratch their backs, uh, but to use them as missiles, definitely uh, they are preparing for a war which will erupt sometime in, in the future. And they still remember what happened in 2006 when Israel was attacked and Israel uh, uh, retaliated in in, in a vicious way, they uh, now have some respect to Israel and they would leave Israel aside at least uh, until they get the order from Iran. However, when we try to look into the issues of Hezbollah, what motivates mm. them? Mm. It is, again, very complicated because everything in Islam is complicated because it, it, it involves religion and politics and personal issues as well. Uh, as you know, Hezbollah are Shiites. Shiites have a constant uh, war for legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the Sunnis. And this is their problem. And uh, they are now competing with the, Mus with the Sunnis who are a better Muslim uh, in the Jihad against the infidels, against the Zionists, in order to show that they are better Muslims, the real Muslims. How do you know this? The name Hizb Allah, means the party of Allah, is taken from the Quran. And in a verse which says, in Hezbollah hum al means the party of Allah, whom they are the victorious ones. And there is an, another verse which says, in Hezb shaitan hum al means the party of the Satan are the losers. Now, in two thousand, two, year of 2000, when we ran away of Lebanon from Hezbollah, they issued a, a plaque of or, or the shield of, uh, of victory, which you we can see here. This is original. 
Uh, and it really, it really tells the whole story of mm. Hezbollah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah. I'm just going to zoom in on it, on it now, so if you just hold it up to that camera, Mordecai. In the name of Allah, the merciful and the passionate. And here they quote this verse, فَإِنَّ حِزْبَ اللَّهُ هُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ حِزْبَ Allah are the victorious ones. Dir al intisar means the shield of a victory. And then, تَقْدِرًا وَوَفَانِ لِسَنِعِمْ مَجْدِ الْأُمَّةِ with appreciation and loyalty to those who brought the glory of the nation, of the Islamic nation, means the Shiite. While the Sunnis brought shame in the defeats of 1948 and 56, all the wars with Israel, the Sunnis lost and they brought shame on us. We, Hezbollah, the Shiites, brought the glory because we are the first in 2000 to have the victory over the Zionists. However, in this plaque, they also reveal the future of Lebanon in this, this, in, in this part. The red and white and red is the Lebanese flag. Mm. Usually in the Lebanese flag, you have the cedar tree in the middle. And the cedar tree actually represents the Christian Maronites because the cedars, the nice big cedars in Lebanon, grow in the district of the Maronites. And this is why they chose this, uh, this cedar tree instead of a cross, which the French didn't like. In this uh, shield, Hezbollah covered, the, or actually removed the cedar, and the, the, they put the Hezbollah icon on the flag to show that the Lebanese flag now has no connection to, to the Christians anymore, only to Hezbollah. Actually, Hezbollah takes over Lebanon in this icon, without words, but this is what they show. Now, it's interesting that the Hezbollah icon actually shows a, a sand, under which the Shiites are buried for 13 and a half centuries, since the uh, Sunnis uh, uh, slaughtered Hussein ben Ali in Karbala in 680. And now, since the, uh, the resurrection of the, of the Shia in 1979 in Iran, a hand comes out from the sand with an AK-47 Klachnikov rifle, and they are tearing the fences behind which they are buried. And this is the icon of the res resurrection of, of the Shia, is, as, um, uh, as shown in the icon. And this replaces the cedar, the Christian cedar, on the Lebanese flag. And this is already in 2000, they exposed their intention to take Lebanon over. I think that um, they might do it any day, especially now uh, when this international court found Hezbollah guilty or suspected to take part in the assassination of uh, Hariri in 2005, mm -hmm. now they might get uh, without boundaries and without any limitations and take Lebanon over only to show everybody that they are the masters of Lebanon, not anyone else. What will it do to the Christians? Either they will run away, really, more nights, will have to run away from Lebanon, not to be subjugated to the Shiite control uh, in, in Lebanon. The other option which might happen is that the, that the Christians in, in Lebanon will divide its, the state to two states. A Christian uh, 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 state in Jabal Sinin, in the, in the district of the Christians, and the other parts which will con be controlled by Hezbollah, and uh, this might be the solution for Lebanon. The only question is, will the world uh, sit aside when Hezbollah takes Lebanon over and subjugates the Christians. And uh, I'm afraid that the way uh, the world treated Lebanon during the last 10 years, ignoring the, uh, the smuggling of so many missiles into Lebanon, actually Europe and maybe other parts of Christendom also gave up on Lebanon mm. and uh, God help the yeah. Christian Maronites in Lebanon. But, but how, I mean, in a future engagement, uh, and looking at the recent statements made by the uh, leader of Hezbollah, uh, Nasrallah, it, it seems inevitable that Israel will again have a military conflict with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. But how does Israel confront terror organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas that don't comply to the Geneva Convention, that instead base their missiles in population centers, 
that hide around civilians and then deliberately target civilians through suicide bombings and missile attacks rather than military installations? And how can Israel win this war when Israel starts retaliating to protect our own citizens? Israel is condemned by the international media for, for war crimes. Well, this is a part of the problem of the asymmetric uh, warfare, which, uh, with a colleague of mine, Dr. Mansdorf, and myself, uh, we wrote an article about this, about this asymmetric war when a state with an army, official army with uniform, tries to fight an army, but which wears a, a civil, uh, civil um, dress. And it's not an army because it, it, it fights from homes. It launches missiles from the basement of a home where kids are playing in the kid room and the mother is in the, in the kitchen, wherever she is, and the grandmother is ironing in the, in the living room. And the, the husband is launching missiles from the basement. What can a state do in such a situation? Uh, destroy the home with the kids and the mother and the grandmother or not? The international law of war did not envision this situation. There is a, a intention in the international law to depart a, a, a civil society from the army, to define. And if you want to fight the army, it's okay. Leave the civilians alone. But when civilians are the fighters from civilians, from, the, the international law doesn't deal with this issue. This is the lacuna inside this international law. And Israel tries to find, uh, find a way how to target those people without collateral uh, damage. But what can we do? Uh, here and there, and, and you can very, very easily see, it happens in Afghanistan, it happens in Iraq, when other armies as well have to deal with insurgency, and civilians are getting hit, either by mistake or by, uh, by accident, because they were in, 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 in a nearby, and uh, those terrorists uh, used them as shields or some, somebody to hide behind. So this is actually the problem of uh, modern warfare, which uh, those terrorist organizations found, because the media, of course, exposes the atrocities of, the, of those uh, either Americans or British or Israelis or whoever tries to fight. And there, there is no good war. A war is a bloody thing. And innocent people are being targeted in a war. Look, what happened in this country, in Britain, during the Second World War? Civilians were, were targeted, London, Coventry, and of course on the other side. So you, you cannot, when an army or an organization like Hamas, like Hezbollah, decides to take civilians as shields, it's very hard to maintain war in such a thing. And the problem is that the more people are killed, in their view, is the better. Because for them, a, a, a living child is a living child. But if it's a dead child, they can expose it, they can, they can show him from different angles and show that at least five boys were killed because this is one, one from another angle. The, 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 this is what Hezbollah did in, in, in the war room. And in Gaza as well, this is exactly what Hamas did. They took picture of one person who was killed when he was killed, when he was brought to the hospital, when he was taken out to be buried, and it's a funeral. So four people were killed instead of one. <laughs> okay, this is how they manipulate the media, and the media falls in this trap too many times, and not to mention uh, distortions which ma made by the media, because of the media uh, has some kind of agenda also sometimes. And states like the United States and Britain and Israel find themselves in, uh, guilty for things which Either they didn't do or they had to do because they have or they must uh, defend their own uh, citizens. What should Israel do when, when a, a missiles from Gaza fall for eight years on the city of Sderot? How many missiles would London tolerate uh, which will fall on London? Once a week, one missile? I'm not sure that London will tolerate even one missile. Why should Sderot tolerate thousands of missiles uh, falling on and, uh, Sderot, on Ashkelon, on Ashdod, and uh, other, other places inside Israel proper? What is this? And, and, and keeping uh, Gilad Shalit for so many years without visiting of the Red Cross, 
without any human rights, and they demand that Hamas prisoners inside Israel who are convicted in court will have TV and academic degrees and um, uh, visits of their families and lawyers and delegations, whatever. What is this? This asymmetry of, uh, of a war which Israel has to face vis-a-vis -vis those uh, organizations. And unfortunately, uh, it, it's not easy. Israel tries to be humane, tries to be a normal state, tries to be, tries to be a democratic state. And of course, the Supreme Court, which is not a tail behind the government, enforces the international law on the government. And we try to find our way between the miserable area where Israel lives, the Arab and the Islamic world, and yet to stay as a European-like democracy, even if we are in the Middle East. Okay, and, and next issue I really want to discuss with you, Mordecai, is the rise of Iran in the Middle East, and particularly the belief of the uh, Iranian president, Ahmadinejad, in the return of the Mahdi, or the 12th Iman. We have a short clip to go to, which shows how the uh, Iranian government is preparing their forces, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, and also the besieges, for a future showdown, not only against Saudi Arabia, but also against Israel, in actually preparing for the return of the uh, 12th Imam. Salam bar Mahdi, o ke ahl asman o zamin ba o ishq mibarzand. Salam bar zamin sazan zuhur va montazaran taru va khurshid. Qarn hast ke jahan bashariyat chashm intezar aamadan mardi ist ke tamam adyan ilahi aamadanash ra isharat dadand. O ke aaine tamam namay jamal ilahi insan kamil va waris tamam anbiya از آدم تا خاسم است و جهان را پر از عدل و داد خواهد کرد آن گونه که از ظلم و جور پر شده بود اما سالی که از ابتدا برای مردم هر دور مطرح بوده این است که آیا ظهور در دوران آنها رخ خواهد داد آیا آنها ظهور را خواهند دید زنان کشف هجاب می کنند و زیبرهای خود را آشکار می سازند قومی از مشرق قیام می کنند و زمینه را برای حکومت محبی آماده می سازند رایه زهور مهور دل شیفتگان حق را بیتا کرده و آنان را به صحنه حضور مرکشند فوکویاما یک ماه پس از حادثه 11 سپتام در مساحبه با روزنامه گاردین تأکید کرد که اسلام تنها نظام فرهنگی است که مدرنیته غربی را تهدید می کند. او تصریف کرد که آمریکا می تواند برای شکستن مقاومت کشورهای اسلامی در برابر مدرنیته از توان نظامی خود استفاده کند. آمریکا پس از 11 سپتام پروژه اسلام حراسی را رسمند می کرد.
آمریکا با همپیمانی چهل کشور حمله به جهان اسلام را آغاز کرد و در طی چند سال صدها هزار تن بمب بر سر مردم کشورهای مختلف مسلمان فرو ریخت. علت تمرکز اشغالگران بر مناطق مذهبی عراق و مسجد صحنه و کوفه و بازجویی از مردم به دنبال افراد با اسامی خاص چه بود؟ ادعای اعتقاد دارند این تهاجم همه جانبه ارتباط مستقیم با مباحث آخر زمانی و ظهور داشت. مانی که عرب ها زمام امور خود را از نفوذ دیگران رها ساخته و عزم جدی آنان دوباره تجدید شود آنگاه سرزمین فلسطین به دست آنها فرد خواهد شد و عرب ها پیروز و متحد خواهند گردید و نیروهای کمکی از سرزمین عراق به آنان خواهند رسید که بر روی پرچمهایشان نوشته شده است القوه حمله به لبنان کردن اشتباه کردن حمله به غزه کردن اشتباه کردن حمله به این کشتی ها کردن اشتباه کردن این اشتباه ها یکی پس از دیگری نشان دهنده این است که رژیم غاصب سهمیستی به نهایت قطعی خود یعنی سرنگون شدن و ساقط شدن در دره نیستی داره قدم به قدم نزدیک می شود Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, Mordecai, we, we saw there in that uh, very disturbing video, which is used obviously for propaganda purposes, how the Iranian regime are preparing their armed forces for future military engagements in the Middle East. What was your interpretation of that uh, uh, Iranian documentary? Well, uh, you have to understand the basis of uh, how those uh, Iranians, uh, those uh, ayatollahs actually, uh, how they think about things. Hmm. And uh, I have two documents which uh, Israel, which we got in the Lebanon war from the Hezbollah. Uh, these actually demonstrate their psyche. In this, uh, in, in this yeah. uh, pamphlet, yeah. Can you just hold uh, up Ali Khamenei, the leader of Iran, is having some kind of a discourse with an image of light. Now, the light is the, is the, is the 12th Imam, the Mahdi, which will come back when Allah decides. But even now, when he is hidden, uh, Ali Khamenei, the leader of the Shia, and in their view, the leader of all the Muslims in the world, is having some kind of discourse with this uh, man of light. And throw him with a deity. Means Ali Khamenei is some kind of mediator between the, mediati, between the deity and, the man, and mankind. Mm. He is like a prophet, almost like a prophet. He cannot make any mistake. He is infallible in their own view. So if they decide to uh, develop some kind of uh, nuclear weapons, who are the British uh, beer drinkers or the uh, American swine eaters or the others in, or other infidels to tell them, the mu'minin, means the believers, what to do and what not to do. Who gave them, those infidels, the legitimacy even to talk to those um, uh, believers in, in, in Islam? This is how they uh, view uh, the difference between the Iranians and the others in the world. This uh, idea is also uh, represented in this pamphlet, uh, which was uh, published uh, four years after the after Khomeini uh, uh, died. And this name, Sutur Nur, means the lines of light. This is a biography of Khomeini, which if you read them, you will see the light. But uh, according, of course, to their, to their uh, view. But this also shows uh, very clearly the divine light, which enlightens his hands, his, ma his mouth, his eyes, and his head. Means what he's doing, what he's saying, what he's viewing is what he's thinking. Everything of Khomeini is enlightened by the divine light. So again, who are the others to tell them what to do and what not to do? Mm. And from this point of view, they have no problem to do whatever they like. To destroy others, to develop weapons which are uh, not allowed, and they committed themselves not to develop them uh, in the NPT. 
and they, their view is the only view which exists in the world. All the others are not counted. This is the basis of how those ayatollahs view the world today. Everything else is tactics and how to deal with the world as it is. They definitely would take the Gulf if they can and thus control the prices of oil. And everybody knows how fragile the economy today is and what uh, changes of oil prices might introduce into the economy of Europe, America and Britain, whatever. So, and, and they are behind it and they can do whatever they like because all the, all the oil which comes out from the Gulf goes under their nose in the Humus Straits. This is one thing. Secondly, they export the revolution, not only to Lebanon where it succeeded, not only to Iraq where they kill Americans and British and others in masses. They export their revolution to Europe with the sleeping cells, they, to America, to Southern America. There are already places which are controlled by the Iranians and by the Hezbollah, to Africa, Australia. Almost everywhere in the world today there are sleeping cells of Iranians and of course the Iranian embassies uh, are smuggling money and weapons inside the diplomatic pouches, weapons to be given to those uh, uh, people in those places. And they only wait for an order to start the mayhem inside those places. So Mordecai, you, you refer to, um, you're talking about terrorist sleeper cells, aren't you? Just, yes, just definitely. And uh, they are waiting for the order. And if something happens in the Gulf or whatever, they might turn the whole world into mayhem. Now, why, why do they do this? Uh, in, uh, Ahmadinejad is part of a little sect in the Shiite uh, 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 sect in, in, in Iran named Hujatiya. Now, those Hujatiya believe that the Mahdi will come in one of two cases. The one case is if all the world will become Shiites and so the Mahdi can come to be their leader. Uh, the second case is when all the world will become, will, will deteriorate into big mayhem so the, the, the uh, Mahdi will have to come to rescue the world before it col to totally collapses. The first case apparently doesn't happen. The, the world is not standing in line to turn into Shiite uh, Muslims. So they would rather turn the, the world into mayhem in order to force the Mahdi to come back uh, as was hinted uh, in this footage. So the nuclear weapon of the Iranians today, actually the, the, the idea behind it is to push the world to a total collapse of all the rules and uh, actually to bring the Armageddon like a uh, period which they believe in, in order to force the Mahdi, the, the Messiah, so-called, to come back to the world and to rescue the world from this big mayhem. So looking at that viewpoint, why are so many of our Western leaders don't understand or don't interpret um, Iranian actions? And, and what is the future for the Middle East? Because we're seeing Iranian dominance emerged, particularly since the war in Iraq in uh, 2003, with Iran's influence spreading all through Egypt, through Saudi Arabia, through Lebanon, Syria. Um, what is the extent of Iran's influence and what is Iran capable of, say, in five years' time? Well, these are two different questions. The West today is governed by secular, liberal, postmodern mindset. Religion unfortunately, doesn't play a major role in the thinking of the uh, body politic of the world. People refuse to see religion in Iran as some kind of motivation to what they do. People do not understand it. People do not go to these depths because they are not used to think from a religious point of view. This is why they say eh, that all they want is hegemony and power and influence. It means they try to impose on the Iranians the Western liberal, modern, postmodern way of thinking as if the Iranians share the same mindset of modern or postmodern liberal mindset. This is a total mistake. And this another mistake of the West, which tries to, to impose on others 
its own way of thinking. What happens in the Middle East today is the riots in Syria might take Syria from the, out from the Iranian pact. Lebanon might have problems because of the lack of Syria as a link between Iran and Lebanon. Turkey is, feels threatened by Iran these days. Iran feels threatened by Turkey, which is not supporting the Syrian regime. And so today there is maybe a new reshuffling of the powers in the Middle East between Iran, Turkey, Syria, maybe Israel also will be dragged into this issue. Things are still on the make, and it's too early to forecast what will be the end of the Arab Spring in the Middle East, which might turn into a very, very cold and stormy winter. And uh, really, down to the last minute, Mordecai, and this fascinating interview. Um, how can Israel survive these changes in the Middle East, and how can Israel maintain its uh, dominance and being the light for democracy in the region? Well, democracy is from within. We are a vibrant democracy which honors human rights and political freedoms, and we change our government every three or four years. Very vibrant democracy. However, when it comes to the outside world, we feel that we need three important components. Intelligence, intelligence, <laughs> and intelligence. When you have good intelligent intelligence, you can very, very clearly listen and see what happens in the, behind the borders and to adjust yourself to the changing atmosphere of the Middle East. And this is what I hope Israel is doing day and night, 24 on 7. Uh, Mordecai, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure today to have you on the Middle East Report uh, and thank you for giving us your insight into the mentality of the Iranians, in the mentality of groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and, and really the direction that the Middle East is, is shaping. So I just want to thank you very much for watching today's uh, Middle East Report and uh, we plan to go out with a song and this is a, a prayer for the IDF because the IDF will fill the front of possibly an Arab winter if things turn very, very ugly in the Middle East. And as Christians, we have a duty, I, I believe, in this time to stand with Israel and the Jewish people, but also to become educated and uh, very much aware of what's happening in the region of the Middle East because it's so volatile, things change so quickly, and it's important that we have a, the right mindset and we are watchful and prayerful as events unfold and shape uh, today's Middle East. Thank you and uh, shalom. Thank you.
Sunday.